This is Think Energy, the podcast that helps you better understand the fast-changing world of energy through conversations with game changers, industry leaders, and influencers. So join me, Dan Segan, and my co-host, Rebecca Schwartz, as we explore both traditional and unconventional facets of the energy industry. Hey, everyone. Welcome back. The electricity grid was built to deliver electricity to homes and businesses a little more than a century ago. It's hard to imagine with our obsession and dependency on technology today how it really wasn't that long ago we lived without electricity. The electricity grid is basically a large machine. Think of it almost as the world's largest machine, but built for the outdated 20th century power systems, which are very simple and flowing only in one direction. As we know, though, machines are complex and they need things like maintenance, replacements, investments, and of course, innovation and upgrades. Well, this large machine is already getting the biggest upgrade in history so it can communicate with our homes, businesses, smartphones, our cars, and watches. More than any time in history, people want to connect and interact with the grid. That would have been unimaginable a hundred years ago. It's definitely an exciting time to be in our industry. There's lots of new incentives being introduced by our government to support things like energy management, cleaner tech, electric vehicles, and smart grid projects. Yes, it was just in March 2022, the Government of Canada released its climate target of cutting emissions by 40% below 2005 levels by 2030. The plan includes $9.1 billion in new investments to cut pollution and accelerate the path to net zero by 2050. It also outlines funding to make it easier for Canadians to switch to electric vehicles, make Canada's electricity grid even cleaner, help industries adopt cleaner tech, empower communities to take climate action, embrace the power of nature to fight climate change, and reduce oil and gas emissions, amongst others. So Dan, let's talk about a relatively unknown technology that I'm told can play a large part in helping along some of these initiatives. They're called microgrids. Microgrids, as defined by the Conference Board of Canada, are systems of interconnected energy users, distributed energy resources, and advanced controllers that form local electricity grids. These energy resources include renewable and non-renewable generators and increasingly battery energy storage systems, which due to their potential for adapting cleaner technologies, microgrids are playing a pretty important role in contributing to our transition for that low carbon future. So here's today's big question. Are microgrids the answer to a faster path to net zero in Canada's clean energy future? Our guest today is Charles Byrne, the manager of grid technology here at Hydro Ottawa. Charles, welcome to the show and to part one of our discussion on all things microgrids. Charles, can you start by telling us a bit about yourself and your role at Hydro Ottawa as a manager of grid technology? Yeah, loving husband, father of two young, wonderful boys, uh, engineer, foodie, uh, and complete uh, energy geek. Um, yeah, my my day job, manager of grid technology. I look after technology uh, that that's used to, to to help us control our grid. So our system operation staff, uh, any platform they use to to monitor and understand what's going on out out in the grids, uh, whether it's uh, you know managing devices or looking at outages that's that's what what my team does and we also look at new and emerging technologies i spend a lot of my time looking at new ventures and looking at uh you know how can we apply our systems and technology to to different problems and how we, how we can improve upon those platforms in what instances or applications can microgrids be applied is there a minimum or maximum microgrid size I wouldn't say there's like a, a minimum or maximum per se. Uh, I would say it, it has to be economically feasible, obviously, and it has to solve the problem you're, you're out to solve. So 
for the most part, I think you'll see larger institutions, larger campuses that that start to look at this technology. Um, at least that's what we're, we're seeing now. But but I wouldn't say that there's there's hard and fast rules as to how big it is or how small it can be. But definitely, you know, the the economics are, are going to play in, into that. Okay, follow up for you, Charles. What is the return on investment for a microgrid? And what are some of the financial, operational, and environmental benefits? I think it's, you know, the ROI question is is obviously the biggest one. And, and it's dependent on on how 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 you take a view upon the whole the whole problem. And it really needs to depend on the, the larger view of things. So you're not looking purely at the, the cost of electricity. You need to look at those other aspects like reliability, um, you know, what does that reliability mean to your particular business or to your community? And if, if you have critical needs or you have uh, carbon objectives or you want to get off of uh, certain carbon sources, then then you can really make it work. Um, but yeah, there it, it's not on a pure electricity cost basis. You're not going to compete with the grid, but um, the the broader you look, the the, the more holistic view you take, it, the more it's going to make sense. Okay, last follow up along this line of questioning. How long do microgrids last? And does it depend on how they're fueled? Um, you know, it depends on how much you're willing to spend, I guess. Um, you know, of your storage, your generation, your consumption, they all have to match up. And if they, they match up perfectly, if you're able to to make storage, uh, you know, have enough storage or have enough generation to make it work, then then you could stay islanded uh, indefinitely. But but definitely it's the the economics of the situation and what you're what your objectives are, then then you can make it as as you know long lasting or as as brief as as you need it to be. Now, Charles, what are the components of a successful microgrid project? What needs to come together? It's those it's those three things. It's it's the generation, the storage, and the consumption need to be kind of in balance uh, in, in total. So you need them to work together, uh, and and to do that, you need technology. Uh, technology is the biz- biggest aspect. Some people say the the smart grid problem is is a software problem, and they're they're actually right. Um, you just need to to have the sources and 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 sinks of that energy balance out, and need to manage dynamically where you're where you're taking the energy from, where you're putting it, and uh, how you're managing those customers and expectations. So we you know we kind of take it. For granted today that we're connected to this unending source of electricity, this grid, right? But uh, you know, the 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 closer in you get to that, um, you need to have that more dynamic and, and technology that that manages that. Okay. Now, in your opinion, who are the ideal customers to adopt this technology? Um, water treatment plants, hospitals, universities, large manufacturers. I think I think definitely the campus the campus uh, style approach is is the ones who are who are looking at it now. We're starting to see traditionally um, co generation projects are starting to expand. So those campuses that need to use uh, or hospitals or other major institutions that need that that already have significant needs for backup or or other you know energy generation um, requirements, then they're the ones that are starting to look at this. And I think those are the ideal the ideal candidates to look at this technology. Can you give us some good examples of a microgrid project here in Ottawa or elsewhere that really showcases the potential? We're starting to see the the educational um, campuses that they're really looking into that. And I kind of mentioned earlier that the, those who have co-generation, we're, we're seeing both, you know, actually all three or three of the, the three of the big ones, uh, Carleton, U Ottawa and, and Algonquin have, uh, some form of cogeneration, and, and U Ottawa, I know, is looking at um, a microgrid uh, for part of their campus. Um, we're seeing a lot of district thermal starting to happen, uh, a lot of a lot of investment in that front. So when you start looking at energy holistically, those are the ones who who can really start to think about, wow, I, if I if I if I take a broader look, uh, use it, all the energy sources, all of the energy uses, then then those are the ones um, who who could benefit from it. We also ran a project here at Hydro Ottawa, a technology project to look at how could we develop technology to make our customers more grid interactive. And, and it's those types of technologies that, that would help uh, in, the, in the creation and management of, uh, of a microgrid. Charles, microgrids use renewable and non-renewable energy sources, correct? Can you expand on what that means? Yeah, um, you know, you can use 
traditional fossil fuel generation, um, fossil fuel sources like natural gas. And again, coming back to that co-generation, that was that, um, you know, the first, the first step in the direction of microgrids that many, many institutions have taken. Um, but also, you know, with storage and solar and wind, these, these things are getting cheaper and, and more commoditized, especially on storage The the dollar per, per kilowatt hour stored is, is dropping significantly and solar is dropping significantly. And so it's, you know, we're starting to see the economics start to make sense where you look at not just the, the traditional natural gas fired um, generation, but you're looking at both um, solar and, and natural gas. Now, wondering if you can expand on what is a hybrid microgrid system. It's it's all of the above scenario, right? I mean, you're you're looking at you're looking at not only just generation in in the traditional sense of of um, of burning natural gas, but you can you can get wind, you can get solar, and then you can be you can be grid connected, and you can think of the grid as a potential uh, generation source or or some some other source of energy that you can balance with. And and I know that's almost contradictory having a microgrid grid tied, um, but it but it you know it could be seen as the the best of both worlds where you're you're just out to solve the problem that you have in the most economical and, and technological um, way that's that's feasible. You know, it, it's not a, it's never a purist game. It's 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 about um, it's about solving what you need to solve for, and 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 don't you know don't don't paint yourself into a corner. It doesn't doesn't make sense. Much like small modular nuclear reactors, are there applications whereby microgrids could be used in remote communities in Canada? And what are some of the environmental benefits for implementing microgrids in these areas? Uh, you know, I, I think traditionally the, the remote communities, the small communities um, have been, you know, heavily, heavily reliant on, on, nat- on, on carbon-based fuels. Like, so diesel generation, bunker oil generation, like really the, the old, old school uh, type of heavy, you know, carbon intense um, generation source. And they're the ideal um, the ideal candidates for this type of technology, not only, you know, in the, in the ideal sense of getting them completely off carbon and getting them on to solar and wind, uh, or even new technology like small modular reactor technology, but even, even optimizing how you're burning the carbon, you know, with, with storage, a carbon plus storage, I know it's, 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 uh, you know, some might see it as an unnecessary middle step, but you know, op- operating any generation source in its in its ideal efficiency window could could see savings and could see efficiency gains, um, and that and that you know that in turn will, will reduce carbon emissions significantly. That's great, Charles. Uh, now, wondering if you could help us better understand why utility partnerships are so important to microgrid projects. I mean, I'm going to speak selfishly a little bit. Um, you know, the, the utilities are your ideal partner. Um, we've got we've got a, a broad selection of of very strong um, technical individuals, but also people who who've been focused on this problem for for many years. And and I you know I think the the first the first blush that a that a customer might look at it and say, well, how does it make sense? I'm trying to get disconnected from the utility in a microgrid sense, but but in actuality, you know, the the technology that could be used here. Um, benefits the utility and the, and the customer could benefit by being connected to the utility. So a partnership could make it economical, could make it feasible. And, you know, we have, we have the ability to, to help you access um, government funding for, for, you know, climate change, but also for um, technology development. So, so I think the utility is a, an ideal candidate to partner with. Um, we, we have that, we have that strength in those abilities that and we're always willing to help. Can microgrids improve local management of power supply and demand and by ricochet defer costly investments by utilities and new power generation? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, without a doubt, it could drastically improve our ability to, to manage load and to target our investment in a, in a more efficient way. So today we're designing, you know, it's, it's our designs driven by the worst case scenario. What could the customer consume? What, what could in the worst case does all of our customers need? And so you see things that you know, we saw it in, in the broader Ontario context with the, the natural gas peaking plants. You know, they spend most of their time just, just sitting around, but waiting for that, you know, that four or five or, you know, six days a year where they need, they're, they're desperately needed and they get 
they get spooled up and they, they, they use carbon and they cost a lot of money to, to maintain and operate. But with, with the technology that underpins these microgrids, you can, you can use it to not only create the microgrid and manage the microgrid, but you can also use it to change the relationship that your customer has with the utility or the microgrid has with its, you know, its, its host utility or partner utility um, and, and being able to dynamically manage the load and sources and, and help to curtail those worst case scenarios where, where it allows the utility to say, okay, I don't have to worry about this one day in 365, I can, I can worry about all the other 364 days and I can optimize for economics or, or carbon across the year and not just always worry about that, that worst case scenario. Charles, what role could microgrids have in accelerating the path to Canada's net zero targets? Where do you see their biggest potential? I see it, you know, as a technology person, I obviously, yeah, I look first to the technology and the, the development of that technology. Um, and it comes back to that worst case scenario where if we start deploying the technology to manage uh, consumption or to help the customer have that two-way relationship with the utility, um, and not just for generation, you know, the customer wants to generate solar electricity, but, but having that dynamic conversation where we're sending each other signals of what we need. Um, then that could help. You can you can just target. What do you want to change? Do you want to change the economics? Well, then you can set your set your signaling uh, on, on economics. And if you want to manage carbon, well, then just say, hey, carbon intensive time. Why don't you? If you're interested in reducing carbon, then we can you know reduce your consumption or move to your your stored electricity. And and uh, you can you can target any uh, any any problem that you want to solve. And one of the big ones could be carbon. Okay. Now, the government of Canada recently announced $9.1 billion in new investments to cut pollution. Do you see opportunities in those initiatives for microgrids? If so, which? Uh, I mean, absolutely. Um, you know, those, those technologies that, that would be leveraged to, to run a microgrid, again, could be used to manage that carbon. And so you could, you know, you could work with technology development, you could work with uh, deployment of that technology, and they're all be eligible for for this government funding to help. You know, you could just say, look, how you manage the carbon with this technology um, will definitely be a significant driver for or an attractor for for any government agency wanting to invest in in carbon reduction. Um, and it has the benefits of of increasing reliability and and making everything much more efficient. Okay, Charles. Thank you for joining us today, but you'll be back here for part two of our discussion on microgrids, where you'll also talk about distributed energy resources, among other related topics. Yeah, I can't wait. Now, it's that time again, Charles. Let's end on a few rapid fire questions. Are you ready to go, sir? Shoot. Okay. What are you reading right now? <laughs> this is embarrassing, but I'm reading... Uh... The, the Three Musketeers by uh, Alexandre Dumas. Um, I, I just finished The Count of Monte Cristo in the fall and I was like blown away. It was so good. So I, I had to go to the next one. Um, so it's the, it's the Three Musketeers. Yeah. Now, what would you name your boat if you had one? I don't have one, but obviously um, you're talking to a, a, an engineer and a geek. So obviously Enterprise is the only answer to this question. <laughs> Charles. Um, who is someone that you admire? I'm going to say my wife on this one. Um, yeah, she's, she's brilliant. She's stronger than me. She's, she's wonderful and, and patient and intelligent. And uh, yeah, no, I, I'm, I admire her so much. And lastly, mon ami, what is exciting you about our industry right now? Change. Uh, change. It's, it's, it's getting, getting faster. Um, people are more interested in it. The, the carbon emission conversation, the environmental efficiency, uh, everything, uh, electrification of transportation, it's all converging on the utility industry. And the utility industry is, is poised for not only regulatory change, but technology change. And, and we're, we're starting to see that with the people uh, who are coming to work for us, who we're attracting. Uh, we're seeing that in the, in the level of dialogue that's happening out in the world. People are talking about us more. Um, and that, that brings pressure, but, but I think it's exciting. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm really, yeah, really excited about the, the future. 
Well, Charles, we'll talk to you again on our next episode. If our listeners want to learn more about you, how can they connect? The email is always there. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, Yeah, yeah, look me up. Again, Charles, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you had a lot of fun and that you'll come back. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Think Energy Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review wherever you're listening. And to find out more about today's guest or previous episodes, visit thinkenergypodcast.com. I hope you'll join us again next time as we spark even more conversations about the energy of tomorrow.